Kelsey Zeiser, Senior Editor at Light Reading. We're here at the NB and SDN Americas event in Dallas, and I'm joined by Bajoy Pankajakshan with Mavenir. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So tell us a little bit about your role at Mavenir. I've been in the telecommunications field now for more than 20 plus years, and out of which 15 of which I've been in the operator side with uh, Sprint and Metro PC is now T-Mobile. Uh, primarily in the technology development and engineering organizations. Um, Mavenir, as you know, is the industry's only end-to-end uh, -end software cloud-native application provider. And uh, our portfolio is pretty comprehensive. We cover radio access, packet core, and a suite of applications for our customers, including mission-critical services like voice and messaging, mm -hmm. as well as advanced services around collaboration security. So in my role as the, as the Chief Strategy Officer for Mavenir, primarily responsible for development and communication of the overall technology and product strategy, as well as uh, facilitating the execution of corporate strategic initiatives. Now the key one is Mavenir is well known in the industry as a, as a disruptive innovative vendor, so I'm also focused on looking at new partnership opportunities mm -hmm. as it relates to enhancing and growing overall portfolio. Mm -hmm. And you're delivering a lightning talk on Telco Cloud. What are some key considerations uh, telcos should consider when implementing virtualized services in public, private, and hybrid clouds? Sure, I think this whole notion of hybrid clouds, whether it's private, public, and now the whole notion of edge clouds as well, is very interesting for vendors, especially as you look at edge clouds, because the whole definition of edge is so different, depending on the person and, and uh, the vendor or the operator that you speak to. So I, I think let's start with discussing uh, when you look at a telco workload versus a public workload public uh, workload, right? Mm -hmm. So the telco data centers today would have to consider the energy and compute efficiency that they have. So for instance, do they have enough wattage to support the high computing density that's available in the public clouds? So public clouds could be a couple of generations ahead in the processes that they use versus what's currently used in the telco workloads. It's not that the telco workloads cannot catch up to them, it's just the amount of time at which the public workload guys or public work providers can actually accelerate and develop these technologies a lot faster as what we have seen as opposed to the traditional telco workload guys. Now the key challenge that the operators will have are the kind of workloads that they need to run in these hybrid environments. So telcos, for example, will have years of legacy applications. So if these applications are not able to actually leverage the tools that are available in the public clouds, then you end up with with porting these applications to work in these public workloads for no reason whatsoever. Your cost may end up being higher at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? You heard AT&T speak about virtualizing 75% of their network, and it was a week ago, I believe, and there the big push was in the use of STN controller to actually manage the MPLS network. But if you look at how STN, or software-defined networking, is actually used in in typical public clouds, there's a lot more use cases. So we need to see this growth of SDN and NFE and the whole web scale platform being adopted in the telco in this multi-cloud environment. Okay, so it sounds like there's both some key technical as well as cultural changes that need to happen. Technical, cultural changes, as well as economic considerations, right? So you need mm -hmm. to start with what are you trying to achieve out of this transition to a multi-edge cloud. So for example, if it's an edge cloud deployment, it's the economic answer could be pretty simple because you're trying to achieve a better user experience for the user. It could be something like an AR, VR kind of application that you're running, and if, you, if that's being processed out of a data center that's running farther away from the edge of the network, mm -hmm. then you end up with the worse experience than if you could actually deliver it out of the edge of the network. That'd be especially important with uh, healthcare applications. Absolutely. <laughs> you hear a lot about uh, operators and vendors talk about the next gen of services that mm -hmm. can be enabled by 5G, and you definitely hear healthcare and you hear connected cars, but there are some technical aspects to consider as well. I mean, there needs to be some of these latency considerations which need to be addressed first, but mm -hmm. those, that's opening up the world to a whole set of new use cases as 5G rolls mm -hmm. out. We've also been discussing uh, cloud native services a lot this week. What are some of the major challenges telcos face in deploying cloud native services? So I guess we should start with defining what is cloud native right. because I hear <laughs> vendors actually, vendors and even operators use this term as a marketing bus right now. And a cloud native starts off, at least in the Mavenir definition, it is, it's containerized, it's Microsoft, even if it's not containerized, maybe there's a way to run it in the microservices architecture. And then more importantly, it's how do you leverage those tools that are available to run this microservice architecture as cloud native. 
So the challenge that we've seen is actually operators, even the ones who've been ahead of this curve, whether it's be the AT&Ts or the Verizons or Adachi Telecoms or, or Rakuten, for the example, deploying a cloud native network. The challenge starts with, am I deploying an NFE OpenStack deployment architecture? Am I going straight to containers? And what we have seen is the early wave of operators who adopted NFE OpenStack went with the distributed architecture where they said, okay, I'll give the infrastructure layer to one vendor, I'll give the, the next layer above it to a second vendor, the application mm -hmm. provider comes in first. And this is, this is challenges not just from the technical aspect of trying to figure out in case of an issue, mm -hmm. the app provider, Mavenir, gets picked up. We get the first call saying, is there an issue? Mm -hmm. Then you end up troubleshooting the end-to-end -end stack. And of course, the other issue is the economic impact of it, because earlier, when we were providing the full stack implementation, you had X amount of dollars distributed to that one vendor versus now we are piecemealing this. Mm -hmm. So it ends up with us having to actually support multiple layers and distributing this money among multiple players. And at the end, having to debug these issues as well. So this is one thing that we're looking at as we transition to the next wave of containerized web scale platforms, is how do you address the challenges at the lower layers? Because our application is heavily reliant on the platform capabilities in this web scale architecture. Okay, a lot of moving parts there. A lot of moving parts yeah. there, definitely. What kind of impact do you think 5G would have on the deployment of cloud native services? I think 5G particularly, in the initial phases, it's going to be driven by the kind of services that 5G can offer and bring to the end user. So enterprise use cases, whether it's campus networks and being able to roll out private networks in this environment. And if you can actually roll out these private networks in an architecture where you can spin this up pretty fast. I'll give you some examples. So we just had, uh, I guess the FCC just approved the first uh, CBRS deployments can actually happen mm -hmm. pretty soon, right? So GA licenses were approved earlier this week. If you look at operators, many of the greenfield operators that are coming up now, whether it's the likes of Rakuten or, or Dish, Dish Network or one and one in Europe, all these operators, their vision is that by deploying a cloud native network, I can now open up this network to actually become a network as a service offering for other operators and enterprises. So if I can actually run this network in a cloud native manner, then I can spin up instances of maybe an EPC or a packet core or an IMS application and start selling it as a service. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that they're looking at monetizing and running their network. And we see this use case consistently from all of these greenfield deployers. And, and not just from the greenfield deployers, even the ones which, are, which have a traditional network to run, they're also looking at, as I evolve my network to be cloud native, how do I leverage the tools of cloud native network to start offering this as a service and, and start monetizing the network that they have? This is in addition to actually running a network at a lower cost and realizing all the benefits of uh, OPEX gains and CAPEX gains by running in this setup. Okay. And you also have a keynote today on tocos and web scalers. What's the key takeaway from that keynote? Actually, I just finished that like five minutes oh. ago. <laughs> and uh, I think the key aspect, again, as I, as I discussed, is as operators look at making this transition from NFE OpenStack to web scale mm -hmm. containerized platform, our premise is that if, if operators is doing that for actually realizing the benefits of of a web scale platform, which is I'm able to run my network at a fraction of cost compared to um, the, the cost that I incur today, what we're saying is the traditional CAS pass layers, which is the, the container service or a platform as a service mm -hmm. offering, whether it's from the likes of traditional CAS pass providers, you have the VMwares and the Red Hats mm -hmm. and others, you could take those layers, but then the telco workloads would require some adaptations. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Bujoy. Thank you. Thank you for having me here.